Wrestling fans, are you ready? Yes! 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 For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Now, please welcome at this time your hosts, Graham GSM Matthews and RJ Marceau. You're listening to the next era of wrestling radio. This is Wrestle Rant Radio. We're back here on Wrestle Rant Radio for October 26, 2023. I am Graham Jason Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having an awesome week so far. Uh, we have a lot to get into here today, a little bit later on with Mr. Marcel, but before that, we're going to be airing my exclusive interview that went live earlier today with SmackDown superstar fresh off a return of the blue brand, Bianca Belair. It was actually filmed and recorded, this interview was, before she returned to SmackDown last Friday. This was recorded two weeks ago on the night of the season premiere of SmackDown, but she returned last Friday. Why not air it now here on WrestleRant Radio? You can check out the full video of the interview right now over at WrestleRant on YouTube, youtube.com backslash WrestleRant, and over in Bleacher Report, on Bleacher Report, in article form. Uh, check it out right now, talking all things, the Sunday scaries. If you have no idea what they are, Bianca's going to get into that. Um, her return to SmackDown, what she's got her sights set on doing, Charlotte Flair, Jade Cargill, potential dream match there, and so much more. Enjoy my exclusive interview with SmackDown superstar, the EST of WWE, Bianca Belair. Graham G. and Matthews here with Bleach Report. Today we're talking to WWE SmackDown superstar Bianca Belair teaming with NBC as part of the Sunday Night Football NBC campaign talking Sunday Night Scaries. Uh, Bianca, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing excellent. We've missed you lately on WWE TV, but of course, you're never not busy, always out talking about this sort of stuff, including, like I said, the Sunday Night Scaries as part of the Sunday Night Football campaign. Yeah. Just talk about your involvement in this and uh, kind of what, what what the connection is there and what you bring to the campaign. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm always into something, so I might not be in the ring right now, but I'm I'm always on the scene. So, uh, but I'm really excited about what I'm doing right now. I'm teaming up with NBC Sports, and what we're doing, we're we're trying to give fans a, a scary good Sunday night. It's a way to say goodbye to the Sunday scaries, which is like all the anxiety, you know, that you get Sunday before Monday before the work week. Um, and we're just doing it by, you know, watching Sunday Night Football on NBC and Peacock. Uh, they're going to have nationwide watch parties all over the world, um, all over the nation. So, you know, it's just trying to make football more than just a game, bring people together through the love of football. It's a unique experience. It's good food, good vibes, just a way to, like, jumpstart your week with a positive note and unwind and just like get rid of the Sunday scaries because they say like it, the Sunday scaries affect 80% of professionals. And I know it affects me. So I'm really excited about this because I watch Sunday night football with my husband. And so it's very, it's like a very unique and organic uh, collaboration with NBC sports. No, it's such a good idea. And I feel like those watch parties are such a key component of it and kind of getting rid of those mm -hmm. Sunday night scaries like you talked about. And you also mentioned there kind of with yourself and how you can relate to those Sunday night scaries, yeah. uh, you know, that sort of thing. Talk about your own experience as far as like, you know, being in WWE, you're always busy. It might not be a typical Friday, uh, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to five, yeah. but you're on SmackDown most weeks and you're on the road every other day beyond that. And then doing stuff like this when you're outside of the ring. But talk <laughs> about how you can relate to that feeling. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely relate to it. I mean, when I heard about the Sunday Scaries and learned what it was about, I was like, I have the Sunday Scaries. That that affects me. And I love Sunday Night Football because for once I get to be on the other side. You know, I get to be the fan. I get to be the one that's, that's booing and cheering and, you know, joining my friends and watching it. But for me, you know, my work week is typically, you know, typically starts on a Friday for Friday Night Smackdown. Then you have Saturday, Sundays for live, for live events. But... For the most part, Sunday is like my last day of work. And so I really get to actually unwind mm -hmm. by watching Sunday Night Football. And it jumpstarts my work work week all over again because I have appearances throughout the week. So usually I'm on the road and I'm watching it, watching Sunday Night, Sunday Night Football with my husband and with his tag team partner, uh, Angelo Dawkins. And, you know, we're either in the car watching it or at a hotel watching it or we're home watching it together. 
Um, but, you know, I just have so many memories from football. My my family is a football family. My brother played football growing up. He's a high school football coach now. Uh, my mom, my dad love it. But I, it just it just jump starts my week. It, it, it It's like I always say, like, I'm really big into self-care. And that's why I love the whole concept of the, of the Sunday scaries, uh, because, you know, this is like a, a cure for the Sunday scaries. And so I get to just spend time with my family. With this, which is my husband and, you know, get social. So it's like a really organic way for me to just get rid of my Sunday scares by watching Sunday night football. I think having that routine helps too, because you talked about how yeah. your work week typically starts on a Friday, go through Sunday. You get to kind of celebrate <laughs> on Sunday by watching football on a Sunday night. But the, the funny thing is, is that for any average WWE superstar, it might vary depending on what show that you're on, <clears throat> you know, with SmackDown being on Fridays, Monday being Monday Night Raw, you were only just drafted to SmackDown a couple of uh, months ago. I mean, obviously you were on SmackDown previously, but you've bounced you know, back and forth between the two brands in the last couple of years. Yeah. So does your <clears throat> viewing habits kind of change, I guess, and your schedule? Does it take time to kind of get used to that schedule being from Raw and then going to SmackDown only within a couple of months? I mean, it's it's essentially the same. It's just that your 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 big TV day goes from Friday to Monday. I mean, essentially in WWE, there's never one day that looks the same. There's never one week that looks the same. Yeah. So you kind of just have to stay prepared and go with the flow. But it really is hard to uh, stay on schedule. So it's it's really cool when you have something that's very consistent throughout the week. Like you're looking for, you know, Sunday night football is going to be on Sunday on Sunday night. So you have that mm -hmm. one thing forward to that kind of resets you because like I said like not the week never looks the same so you know for for this week you know I'm usually on the road I'm usually at Smackdown I'm not right now and so my husband's on the road so this week you know if hopefully we can get together on Sunday we can watch the game this week with uh with New York with the, with the Giants versus the Bills this weekend so hopefully we can watch it together but it really it's like the one consistent thing through the week that really like sets the tone because everything else kind of just you have to make sure that you don't find yourself getting into like an autopilot mode yep. where you're just kind of going through the motions because you, I just try to take it day by day uh, <laughs> and give my best every single day. But I know that like Sunday night football is going to be on Sunday. And that's like the one thing that keeps my week consistent. I feel like everything you just said right there and everything about the football, like the usual football experience and watching football. I mean, again, not every WWE fan's a football fan, not every football fan's a WWE mm -hmm. fan, but there's a lot of similarities there. Raw is on it the is. same time every single week, every <laughs> Monday, and has been for 30 years. No off season either. Um, so how can you think, how do you think WWE fans can relate to the Sunday night scaries or I guess the, you know, Saturday nights, I guess it depends on what day of the week we're talking about here, but how do you think <laughs> WWE fans can relate? Or is it basically the same thing? I mean, I feel like we basically, we kind of give the same thing. Like you said, it's, it's, we give entertainment and we give a, a, a sense of um, an outlet, you know, on, on Mondays and on Fridays. And it's something where you can get together with your family, and your friends, and it brings together people like through the love of wrestling. It brings together people. My favorite thing is to see like father and daughters that come to the shows and they say, you know, I got my daughter into wrestling. We watch wrestling together on Mondays and on Fridays and on Tuesdays, like they have their set days. So I feel like, WWE gives the same thing as as the NFL. So that's why it's really cool with this collaboration because I understand it. I'm just on the other side of it. Yes. <laughs> so I understand, like, I get out of NFL, but I feel like our fans get out of WWE. Oh, definitely. Like I said, there's just so many similarities there. It's something that people can look forward to and expect mm -hmm. Sunday night football. And for so many years, up until a couple of years ago, we had the Sunday night pay-per-views as well. PLEs now, as they're known from WWE, now shifting to the Saturdays. Did you have any thoughts on that as far as like, I mean, again, I guess you weren't on the pay-per-views for too long before they shifted to Saturdays, you know, primarily. But I feel like Saturdays is such a better night for, for these PLEs as far as people not having to wake up and go to work the next day. It's such a better, um, you know, thing to look forward to, I guess it's from a performer standpoint. I just want to get your thoughts on that. I mean, yeah, I was, I was here for a while when the PLEs used to be on Sundays and then it switched over to Saturdays. I think one of the first ones was, I don't want to get this wrong. Maybe day one. I'm not sure. Oh, that was day on one. Yeah, I think so. Um, but no, I think it's great because I think it's, it's, it's something where you, you're not worrying about having to, get in late and you're not, you know, necessarily out watching, you know, the show and you're looking at your watch thinking already thinking for it to Monday. You can't yeah. live in the moment. So I do like the PLEs to be on Saturdays because I feel like it's just the weekend and you're just like having a weekend vibe and you're not thinking about 
what's next. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just thinking about you're in the moment right then and there. So, but I mean, they, they, they both have their, their benefits when it's on Sundays that you, you have, it gets you, you, you start looking for it more to Monday for Monday night raw, but you know, if they, it's like a give and take with both. Yeah, I feel like, again, the, the similarities there with the routine of people just getting through the work week to watch football on a Sunday or on a Monday or on a Thursday. And same thing with WWE on a Monday or a Friday or a yeah. Tuesday, which is why it's so weird when we hear this stuff lately. I mean, again, nothing's set in stone, but like with the whole Endeavor deal going through, Monday could become, or Raw rather, could become another night. You could move to a different night at some point off of Mondays, which is just so bizarre as a, as a <laughs> WWE fan. When you hear something like that, can you even imagine raw being off of mondays and especially as a performer being on the brand again nothing set in stone just talk right now i guess we'll see how it develops going forward but uh it, it's hard to imagine raw being off of mondays in the future <laughs> i mean i know we we're so used to hearing monday night raw so but i yeah. mean we just have to see what happens in the future i know that it's been a huge part like a routine for so many people for so long but you know things change things evolve we'll see what happens but if it moves from Monday to another night, then you have another night to look forward to. But we'll have to wait and see what happens. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see what happens. We know SmackDown staying put on uh, on Friday nights, that being USA starting next year. You know, Fox for right now, obviously. So we have yourself to look forward to on Friday nights for right now. But that's the million dollar question right now, Bianca. When can we expect you back on WWE TV? We got the season premiere tonight as we speak right now. But you, you've been away for a little while, obviously staying busy, like we mentioned. But yeah. any any thoughts on when we could see you back on on uh, inside the square square uh, inside the squared circle? rather yeah tonight's a big night um i know the, i feel like the anticipation is building to to figure out when i'm coming back if i'm coming back we don't know let's see what happens <laughs> but you know uh no it's uh i feel like i do have a, a lot of unfinished business uh you know one of the last things that happened before i left was win the title then getting cashed in then damage control you know taking my knee out and targeting me so um i definitely have some unfinished business uh just trying to figure out when i'm gonna come in you know try to complete what what was started um but, you know, hopefully soon. Uh, I, I really don't have an answer for you. Just still trying to smooth some things out and um, just trying to see when I can get back in. I, I just when I when I come back, I'm, I'm going to come back better than ever. So I don't want to come back too soon. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. And the landscape makes noise. <laughs> yeah, no, most definitely. People are looking forward to it. And that's the best part about WWE. You never know when things can happen. And any time yeah. we could see you show up, whether it be a PLE or on SmackDown itself, you never really know. But that being said, the landscape already of the blue brand has changed drastically with EOS Sky as champion. We have Bailey in the mix, Charlotte, Oscar, so many great competitors. Uh, but speaking of the Charlotte program, I thought that was kind of a refreshing change of pace before you know you took your hiatus from SmackDown, seeing you work with Charlotte for the first time on a consistent basis, that is. Uh, the mm -hmm. feud you guys were kind of putting together, we saw more of an edge to your character before you took time off. <laughs> uh, maybe outside of the title picture, too, we could see you. Obviously, you want the belt back, but you know, coming back and doing something outside of the title scene. Just talk about that a little bit as far as the evolution of your character since losing the championship. I mean, at SummerSlam, too, but primarily back at... Uh, whenever you first lost it a couple of months ago. Yeah, you know, I feel like I was champion for a very, 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 very long time. And it's great to be at the top, but, um, you know, it's, I feel like it's been a change of pace. And I think Io Sky, she, she's amazing. Um, it's going to be very hard to knock her off of that throne, especially with her surrounded by, you know, Bailey and now, you know, Dakota's back in the mix. So it's going to be very hard to knock her off of that throne. Um, but, you know, yeah, it, I, I feel like it was just a change of pace for me. And I feel like I I never wanted to really like mess with, with what I had going on. Cause it's like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> you know, like don't try to fix it. It's not broke. So don't try to fix it. And I was champion for so long and it wasn't broke, but not saying it's broke now, but um, you know, just coming back with, you know, a different mentality. But before I left, it was really cool to be able to work with Charlotte. Everybody knows Charlotte, somebody who I've always looked up to, um, always wanted to get in the ring with, always wanted to get in the ring and be across the ring from her uh, in a sense. But it was really cool just to be able to be in the ring with her and, and tag with her before we went in in the SummerSlam. Um, but, you know, right now I'm just focusing on just trying to recover, trying to get back and uh, go after EO and not just after EO, when you fight EO, you're fighting three people, essentially. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I've been fighting them. Forever. I've been fighting damage control, I feel like, for two years at this point. <laughs> so we're just stuck with each other. They're, they're stuck with me. I'm not going anywhere. They can try to get rid of me, but I'm not going anywhere. 
You're not done until you get that championship back. And you were champion the first time. So it's one of those rivalries that we will never really see the end of. You guys will always be working together. You and Charlotte as well. So many potential matchups. But last question for you, Bianca. I I would be remiss. You haven't been gone for WWE long. But in the time that you've been gone, you've got a new superstar on the scene that people I'm sure have already asked you about. Jade Cargill arriving in WWE. And we don't know where she's going yet. Raw, SmackDown, NXT. We have no idea. But she's popped up here and there. And the number one match that people have mentioned that she that people want to see her have not even well before she came to WWE was yourself and Jade Cargo. So just talk about the arrival of Jade in WWE and thoughts on uh, potentially facing or teaming up with her at some point. Yeah, before I, I even used to get questions, you know, about facing Jade before she even came to WWE. And I would always say, well, everybody always wants what they what they can't have. Yeah. But now it's a possibility. So it's very exciting. I got, you know, I feel like everybody's talking about Bianca Belair versus Jade Cargill. I think that would be a, a, a WrestleMania caliber match, but also too a tag team. You, there's so many possibilities, you know? Um, so I'm very excited for it. I think it's amazing the way she's been able to make a name for herself and the the hype that she's been able to to build around herself before even having a match. I think that's amazing. Um, and then, you know, just looking for her to like hit the scene and carry that momentum and, and not let up with that. But, you know, I just think it's amazing. I've, I've said before that, you know, I'm, I'm here to bring myself and my culture and representation to the table and having Jade here, she's going to add more to it. Uh, WWE is, continues to evolve. And, you know, I always say I'm here to represent and inspire. And what's better than one of us is two of us. And so I want us to both come in here and coexist and and, and, and put in work together and inspire, encourage three and four and five and six and seven more to come along the way and have WWE to continue to evolve. But, you know, it's very exciting. Uh, I always say that we have the best women's roster in the world. So to add Jay to it, uh, it's only just going to benefit be- benefit us even more. Our schedule is like none other. So just, you know, come in, put the work in and let's get down in the ring. <laughs> WrestleMania 40. It's got to happen. Either you guys as opponents are on the same side of the ring. It's got to happen in Mania. Maybe before then, maybe we get spoiled, but we'll see. You know, time will tell. <laughs> let's enjoy the present right now. We look forward to having you back in WWE soon and looking forward to you, uh, looking forward to be, you being a part of this campaign as well with Sunday Night Football and Sunday Night Scaries. Uh, Bianca, always a treat talking to you. Appreciate the time and best of luck with everything going forward. Thank you so much. Big thanks to Bianca for the time. Always a treat talking to her. I think that's like the fifth interview I think we've done in the last couple of years. I've talked to her annually now, dating back to 2020 in the fall of 2020, right after WrestleMania in 2021. I talked to her in 2022, actually, just about a year ago around Thanksgiving. I uh, talked to her in person earlier this year over Rumble Weekend and again here. So a lot of Bianca interviews. She's always a treat to talk to. You can catch her every Friday on SmackDown and also check out her campaign as part of Sunday Night Football with the NFL you know, uh, raising awareness of uh, Sunday night scaries with the viewing parties and stuff like that. Really cool stuff going on right now with Bianca. Now we throw it to my conversation with Mr. Marceau, breaking down Raw for Monday, night one of NXT Halloween Havoc from Tuesday, Dynamite last night, some Will Ospreay news, and so much more. Mr. Marceau, brother, five days out from Halloween. How you feeling? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. You got your costume picked out for next week, or are you not going on his ending this year? Uh, yeah. What am I, I'm going to try Ceratops. Triceratops. Is Molly going as a dinosaur too? We're both being Triceratops. I love it. What was the inspiration behind that? I have no idea. Honestly, I think she said, let's do it. I said, sure. <laughs> You're just like, whatever. Basically, yeah. If it's some, if it's a costume I can buy, and then I'm in. Yep, there you go. Listen, we'll talk about Halloween here in a second, just talking about costumes and whatnot, and talking about, you know, things coming back from the dead. TNA's coming back from the dead. This was the announcement made last Sunday, or Saturday, I think, after uh, Bound for Glory. At the end of the show, I didn't watch until Sunday, and I saw a lot of people chatting about it on Sunday and whatever, but I, I finally caught up on Sunday, and I was like, what the fuck? And it was a great show, too. I've been following Impact. I have never not followed Impact for the last 10, 15-plus years now. Probably one-year period a long time ago, but other than that, I've stuck with TNA through the ga- the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I mentioned TNA. TNA is back. TNA has come back from the dead starting in January of 2024. Now, we don't talk about Impact here on the show. I do Impact interviews and stuff. We don't really talk about Impact itself. It's a great show, actually. It's actually uh, consistently entertaining, at least uh, from what I find from watching the show the last couple of years. But they're ditching the Impact name in favor of TNA. TNA is on its way back, and the internet... There, there has been some criticism from like me and other people, but the vast majority of the response has been pretty positive, which is kind of surprising to me. And uh, 
you saw it as well. You, you DM me about it as soon as it happened. Talk about that. TNA is on its way back, Mr. Marceau. Again, like we like I said, we don't really talk about TNA much or Impact here much on the show. But I did want to get your two cents on this because me personally, I'm not a fan of this at all. No, I mean, I think... I guess, I, I, I guess like the only positive I could think of is like maybe like old people that used to watch TNA, it's like the name itself is back. But like, do they have like a TV deal? Like, I don't even know where they're even on. So it's like... They can bring back TNA. I feel like it's a step back. Like TNA switched to Impact. Now it's going back to TNA. It's like you're going back to a past failure. I don't know. I think like business wise, it's not the greatest move. Like I said, if anything, it's more like a nostalgia thing. But I don't think like all these people are just going to go start watching TNA again. No, I don't think so. As far as the TV deal goes, um, they are on TV. They're on Access TV, which is not a mainstream network. It's not. Spike TV, which is where they were 10 years ago. Among other networks, they've kind of sl- gradually gone backward as far as the networks go. They actually went back up because the channel they were on before Access, they've been on Access since um, Impact was bought by Anthem, which owns Access TV, which is why they're on Access TV. Before that, they were on a channel called the Pursuit Channel, which I'm not even sure is around anymore, and they barely did any viewers from week to week, and a lot of people didn't have Pursuit Channel, so they had to put it on Twitch, and now they're on YouTube as well. You can watch the show on their streaming service, you can watch it on YouTube. It's a pretty easily accessible show. As far as like an actual network, they're on Access, which is not a great, widely available network. The question is, like you kind of mentioned there, in going back to TNA, does it help with that? Does it increase the exposure of the product? To me, and I would agree, I think it is a step backward. Um, only because they've done, in my opinion, in watching the show, such a good job of rehabbing the image and the identity of the company the past five years that to go backward to calling it to what it used to be at a time when TNA's stock was lower than it had ever been, for for what rationale either? Because I saw PW Insiders report that people within the company love the TNA history and they want to merge the history, which it's all the same thing anyway. It's not like Impact. It's not like it's called GFW or whatever. Like Impact is a sub-product of, of TNA and always has been. The show has been called Impact for the past 20 years. Um, but you have that, and they were saying that you know, internationally, they call it TNA anyway. It's like, what is their base internationally anyway? I'm sure they have a good TV deal over there, but they don't run international shows. They've done a couple international shows this year. But the product, for as much good buzz as it's, as it's gotten for its good shows, hasn't really grown in terms of, you know, amount of people reached. And that's through a lot of different things of bringing talent in, working with AEW, getting exposure through them. And it didn't really make a lick of a difference. Do you think calling a TNA again, as I do, um, in, in my opinion, that when you call a TNA again, it kind of brings back the negative stench? We would always joke here on the show, oh, this person's got the TNA stench, which was a very real thing, not literally, but figuratively. In terms of people coming out of that company, they would have to do a lot to wash away the bad booking that they endured during their time in the company. Not everyone, like there was a lot of top stars in that company, but a lot of people left on their own accord because of how bad it was in the mid-2000s. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think that's my main kind of critique with it. Like, yeah, you're bringing back the nostalgia name of the company, which, like, I guess I don't know if say it's heyday, but it was as, as most viewed, that's what it was called was TNA. But like I said, I think it's also bringing back the, the stench. Like we said, like, every time someone would leave, like, they, can they get that TNA stench off them? I don't know. I just, I think it's just a nostalgia move, but I don't think it's going to work, like, in the, in the future. Like, I don't think that's going to, like, bring people more people to watch with the product. I think it's just bringing up, like, history. Yeah, but that's, that's really it. I think people, they're at a point now where I think it's great that people think of TNA, or at least the vast majority of people, hear the initials TNA, and they're thinking, oh, man, I used to love TNA, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, it's not like if they had done this five years from now, I would be more of a fan of it than I am now. It's not a timing thing, because it has been a while since they were called TNA. It's probably been maybe six years since they were TNA. It's been a long time. Because they were GFW for a while and then Impact. It's probably since early 2017. So probably six or seven years. It's been long enough. But at the same time, though, I mean, I just see when they mention like, oh, we're going to bring back old TNA concepts and stuff like that. But again, as someone who watches the show, I can tell you they're already doing that. They already have the Ultimate X match and stuff like that on a regular basis. It's not a special thing. And if they're only going back to the company in name only and they're not bringing back the six-sided ring, which... They shouldn't. I mean, it was a cool throwback thing when they brought it back in 2014. I was a big fan of it, but that was kind of before it became public that people just did not fucking like work in the ring because it would be hard on their bodies. Um, 
I just don't think it's a step in the right direction for the company. I don't know. I mean, this is the most buzz that they've gotten in a long time. So, I mean, they got what they wanted with people talking about TNA. Um, I, I just don't think it's a positive move. I really don't. I don't think it's going to negatively affect the company, but I always thought the initials were stupid. I mean, it's literally tits and ass. That's literally what it's called, and it started out as a joke from Vince Russo, um, you know, calling it TNA, like, oh, it's an inside joke type thing. But I can't imagine, like you said, that the that the audience is going to grow exponentially to warrant this move making sense, if that makes sense. No, yeah, I agree. I think it's, like I said, it's just more of a nostalgia thing. I would even say it's more of like a lateral move. I don't think it's going to sure. hurt business. I don't think it's going to make it any, be- any better. It's just kind of, I don't think, like I said, I think it's just a lateral move that maybe it'll get a little buzz. Like I said, at least it's getting buzz, I guess. Like, TNA doesn't really have any buzz to begin with. Um, but I just, like I said, I think in the grand scheme of things, it's just a lateral move that's not really going to have any effect on the company. Got to bring back LOL TNA, the old meme, LOL TNA. But, I mean, and they haven't had a lot of LOL TNA moments in recent years, and I hope they don't going forward. Again, the product's a lot better than it used to be. Um, but they need to send the message that if it really is a new era for the company, they got to move in a positive direction and not move backward. And that would include talent acquisitions. They've lost a lot of talent this year, and not in a bad way. They have a big turnover rate in terms of, Again, not in a bad way where people work there and it's like, well, this is terrible or I'm not being booked correctly, I'm going to move on. No, it seems like they bring people in and then when they get bigger opportunities elsewhere like AEW or WWE, it's kind of a platform for those bigger companies. That really impacts identity at this point or people will go from their com- those companies to impact, kind of restart their careers and then go back to those other companies. Mia Yim did that, Chelsea Green did that. Uh, Sammy Callahan was an impact for a very long time. He actually just recently left. He might be AEW bound at some point. For what reason? I'm not. I mean, I like Sammy Callahan. I'm not really sure what he would do in AEW aside from like a one off with John Moxley or something who he's apparently close with. But um, you know, even still, Impact has a really good roster. They've had a really good roster for a long time now, and a lot of the people that you see right now in the major companies started in TNA. Eli Drake, the, the now LA Knight, the number one contender for the World Championship, is a former fucking impact world champion i mean a lot of these people that we've seen these major companies samoa joe we saw him on uh dynamite last night might be getting the next AEW world title shot he is a former tna world heavyweight champion uh you see it all uh, aj styles being another one among among many other people um i hope them the best going forward i just don't think it's a great move that being said though i mean they might be able to conjure up some positive buzz depending on who they sign going forward this was my next topic of conversation here that being, if they really want to send a message that TNA is destination viewing, not to be confused with Destination America, which is where they were a couple of years ago, they need to make some big moves in 2024. Moving up to a bigger network would be it. I think the CW might have more exposure than Axis. It has to. The CW is a top 20 network, I believe. I think I get the CW. I don't think I get Axis, but I definitely have the CW. And that's where the NWA is ending up. Um, so if the NWA is a better TV deal than you do, that's not a great sign. But... They got to work on the on the TV deal and the exposure with that sort of stuff. But as far as the talent goes, again, they can make a really uh, strong impression at the beginning of 2024 with that hard-to-kill pay-per-view if they can bring in some really big names. They brought in big names in the past, but it's been a long time since TNA had the roster that it did 10, 15 years ago, or even 20 years ago. Um, two names that could potentially be TNA-bound, Will Ospreay, and CM Punk. Now, I don't think either guy signs full-time with the company. It's a lot more likely Osprey does than Punk. But Punk was backstage, not at Bound for Glory, but the Fallout show the next night, also in Chicago. Uh, we'll save Osprey for a second, because I feel like there's a deeper discussion to be had there. But we talk about Punk almost every single week here. We didn't really talk about him a lot last week. We'll keep this one brief. Today is his birthday. The guy's, I think, 45 years old now. Do you think a 45-year-old Punk could end up an impact in 2024? And is the world ending if it does? I mean, it's possible. I just don't think it's going to happen. I mean, I don't know. Like I, said, I feel like TNA is more of a or impact slash spot to like rehab your career. Like, I just feel like it just it's just low. Like, it just would be like him going to the minor leagues. I just don't like. I think it's even way lower than AEW. So, I I, I don't think he'd go there. I think it's way below his level. Um, I, I just I think that's a quick no for me. Do you think he can make at least, not a, not have a run there, but do you think he can make at least an appearance or something to just at least hold him over until he's ready to go back to WWE? Not until, I mean, I feel like he's ready as soon as possible. It might be WWE has to be ready for him. But I could see him maybe making at least one appearance if they can't sign him to a deal because they can't afford him. I mean, but what the what thing is, what, what does that do for TNA? It gets people talking about TNA because he makes an appearance in TNA. It's like, oh shit, if Punk shows up, then anyone can show up type thing. 
Yeah, I guess, but if it's just a one-off and nothing comes out, like, if it's just a one-off and he goes back to WWE, like, I feel like that would just not do much for them. Well, it wouldn't hurt know, them I'd either, right? I would say no. Okay. I mean, I could, I'm not saying it will happen, but it's possible. As we get into 2024, and there's a lot of wild predictions, and we'll save our predictions for the end of the year, I hate, you know, I fucking hate doing predictions, because I'm always wrong. Every single time I can't come up with predictions, and when I do, they're always inaccurate, but... That could be one. Punk ends up an impact, maybe not full time, but or long term, but maybe temporarily. Will Osprey being the other one is definitely more likely, as I mentioned. His contract with New Japan Pro Wrestling is up in February 2024, so in about three or four months. There's been a lot of chatter in recent months, and especially this week, of what is next for Will Osprey? Where will he go in 2024? Does he stay with New Japan? Does he go to TNA? He popped up at Bound for Glory last week, had a match with Speedball Mike Bailey, and had a great match with him. Um, his style kind of fits impact. It's a definite step down from any other company he could sign with, but you know, again, it would be a big signing for TNA to kind of kick off this new era on, on a, on a high note for them, literally and figuratively, I guess, with him being the high flyer that he is, but TNA is an option. New Japan's an option. Um, AEW seems like the most likely landing spot. And there's also WWE. Now, Osprey did an interview a number of months ago with Chris Van Vliet and mentioned that it didn't outright say that he wouldn't go to WWE, but he, he kind of heavily implied that it wasn't really on the table for him because he wants to stay in the UK and, you know, he loves what he's doing right now with New Japan. He's loyal to them. And if he's in AEW, we could still do the New Japan thing on occasion if he wants to. If he's in WWE, they don't play well with others. That's not going to happen. He would probably have to relocate to the US, but we've seen this before. I mean, they signed Walter and he was in the UK for years while still working for WWE, but he eventually changed his mind, relocated, and now he's one of the biggest stars in the entire company, at least one of the best booked on either brand by far. Uh, Will Osprey could be a similar case, and he wouldn't have to go to fucking NXT UK first. He would go, I would imagine, right to the main roster. I can't imagine he'd be working, you know, full sale on Tuesdays with, um, you know, whoever, uh, Braun, I mean, Braun Breaker's main roster bound, but... Um, you know what I mean. I, I don't think he'd be on, on the Tuesday night show. He'd probably go right to the main roster. Give me your thoughts on Will Osprey, because I know you've had exposure to him through AEW. I, I know you've praised his work in the past. Where would you like to see him go? Where do you think he's going to go? And where do you think he's the best fit for in 2024? Yeah, I think it's tough. I mean, I, just, I feel like WWE would make the most sense if there was mutual interest there. I mean, like you said, I guess if he doesn't want to leave the UK, it could muddy things up. But, I mean, all these people say, like, oh, I don't want to go to WWE. I mean, I just feel like it's just like the cop out, like, oh, I don't want to go. Like, why wouldn't you want to go? It's like, if you're an actor, you're like, oh, I don't want to work for fucking MGM, like, or like one of the big, like, universal, like, I don't want to work for them. Like, I don't want to work for indie promotions. Like, I don't know. I just feel like if you're in that profession, like, why wouldn't you want to? I mean, obviously, things can change, and, like, you might not get booked right, but I just feel like. I don't know his exact age. I think he's a little bit... I think he's in his early 30s, if I'm not wrong. I think um, he's 30 years old, actually. Exactly. Perfect. So, but like, I think, realistically, I think he'll probably stay, like, New Japan, AEW, I, w- I would guess. I just feel like that's what he's... I just... If I was taking an educated guess, that's what I'd say. I mean, he could go to TNA. I mean, like I said, I just... I don't, I don't know if that's really going to help a lot. I think he'd just be better suited staying in AEW at that point. I think it'd be foolish not to take a look at WWE. I mean, I could maybe see a scenario where, and this isn't that likely, where he goes to TNA first, maybe goes there for like six months, and then he goes to WWE. Um, I could definitely see that happening. Where it just, I mean, I guess at that point, if they're interested in 2024, why not go straight to, um, you know, why not go straight to WWE and be on the road to WrestleMania? But if he were to go to WWE, and I said that I think there's a, you know, not an impossible chance, but there is a chance he can go there. I mean, we've seen people make that jump before, do what's outside of their comfort zone, and also do very, very well in WWE. We've also seen people make the jump and not do all that well in WWE. What do you think his ceiling for success is in that company? Is he just a mid-card guy with what he can do, or do you think he can excel beyond that? Again, I know you're kind of more exposed to his matches of what we've seen on AEW, but he's also a really good promo as well, and to me, he just screams star. I think you would agree with that as well. He comes out and he has that aura about him. I think, to me... I know it's not the exact same thing as AJ had the U.S. exposure for like 10 plus years in TNA and Ring of Honor before coming to WWE. Osprey's obviously had U.S. exposure in Ring of Honor and AEW recently. And New Japan's more popular now than it was, you know, even, I mean, actually, it's, that's not necessarily true. In 2016, New Japan was pretty big. Um, but still, I mean, if Osprey were to come in, I could see it being similar to what AJ Styles did in 2016, where he comes in, works with all the new people, 
fights for the world title. He's an upper mid card guy, maybe a main event guy at some point. And he's someone that I think they could use in either brand right now. And they have their own talent in developmental. Don't get me wrong. They can call up Carmelo or Braun and those guys will have bright futures. Osprey is someone to me that is ready right now that doesn't have to go through the whole system of going through NXT or whatever and having to work his way up. I think he could be slotted pretty high early on. Or am I just am I just fantasizing here and that's not actually uh, all that likely or all that feasible? No, I think it is. I think it sounds right. Like I said, I think he could be used on either brand realistically. I, f- I mean, specifically SmackDown, I feel like they need heels. But uh, no, I think he, like I said, I would not put him on NXT. I think he's one of those people who just main roster ready. Like I said, not the same as AJ, obviously, because AJ was on TNA and, like I said, on American TV for over 10 years. But I think you could have him, like, slot him right in and he could work right away just like really depend on the right opponent i mean everyone just says him and seth i feel like it really depends on what seth's doing at that time but like i feel like that would be like a good first opponent for him i mean they've had like the beef and stuff like that but mm-hmm. i just feel like they work their styles i just feel like would work together well i mean i know it's not the same i know he's from the uk but like i'm not exactly sure the date of that Perth show but like close enough like perth australia i feel like we have more hardcore fans there than they do here. So, like, be kind of, like, a perfect place for him to debut if he was going to WWE. Yeah, I mean, uh, AEW also has All In every year, so he might want to be a part of that again. He had the fucking, you know, attendance number tattooed on his neck or his body somewhere, which is pretty dumb. But, you know, that obviously meant a lot to him, and doing that again might be something of high importance. Um, You mentioned that he could come in and, and... do well in a high role. I think he's capable of that. I'm not sure if you were saying if he's capable of that, or you think WWE would actually do it, or are you saying both? Both. Okay, you think they would actually bring him in and he would be, like, for example, I mean, his contract's up in February, so this isn't going to happen, but do you think he could come in and do an AJ Styles type thing where he gets, like, the big pop at the Rumble, and I think a Rumble crowd would pop for him because it's a lot of hardcore fans that attend those shows, Um, or, but he comes in and has, like, a match, like, a prominent match at Mania, and he's not just Ricochet 2.0? No, I think, I think, I, yeah, no, I think I, I see him definitely more than that. I feel like he's built his physique a little bit more than Rick Shea anyways. Yeah. But, uh, no, I think, the, I think, I think he could be big. And does going to WWE make his in-ring style less special that they kind of have him tone it down a little bit? Or do you think, I said this on Hashtag on Wednesday, but that might actually be a positive in the sense where he's worked that style for so long and he's actually toned down his style in recent years because he just can't do it as much because he broke his fucking neck a couple of years ago. But do you think that might be a positive and that it gives his body a break and that might be what he's looking for at this point? Like Nakamura. I mean, Nakamura was a lot older when he went to WWE in 2016. But it could be a similar situation where he just goes there because it's easier on his body and he's also making a lot of money. Yeah, I think so. Like I said, I think, I mean, his style is, like I said, definitely toned down from what he is. But like I said, he also got a little bit bigger. Um, just can't get away with that stuff. And he's a little bit bigger than he was originally. But no, I think, I mean, like I said, I think it means, I just, I don't know, I feel like it's always... To me, specifically, for those people, it'd be foolish to not even attempt there to be. Like I said, if there's no interest, obviously there's nothing you can do. Um, but if there's interest there, I feel like it's just foolish not to try. It's like if you're a football player, if you get a chance to the NFL, oh, no, I'm not going to go with the NFL. Like, why wouldn't you just give it a chance? I don't know. I feel like, obviously, there might be other circumstances, but, like, you're in the wrestling business. Why wouldn't you want to try the biggest company out there? Yeah, I mean, it depends how long of a deal he signs. I mean, they let go of people whenever they want. I don't think they would do that to Will Ospreay if they're going to pay him a lot of money, but, you know, I don't know how how long Cody Rhodes signed for, but my thing when he was almost going back to WWE, and he did, was, if it doesn't work out, then you go back to AEW or whatever, but I think it's worth a shot, and it's obviously paid off for him. I think the same can be said for Will Ospreay. I'm not saying he should go to WWE, but I think it would not be a dumb decision, because it's very polarizing. I've seen people say, oh, it would be incredibly dumb if he went there, and I've seen other people say, why wouldn't he go there? Like, it makes sense for him to go there. He should go there, so... I mean, I don't know if that's just the hardcore WWE, AEW war that fans have with each other, and it's like, it's one company against the other, but still, I mean, he's going to be a big get wherever he ends up. It might be a silly question, but do you th- what do you think his ceiling for success is in AEW? In the sense that you would expect, okay, he's going to be a top guy, obviously, but at the same time, they already have a lot of top guys. They have an Omega, they have MJF, assuming he resigns. Uh, Ricky Starks, they're building up. They have JY, he's doing really well right now, among others. John Moxley, the entire Blackpool Combat Club. Do you think he's one of those guys that could be booked well in AEW? Jay White wasn't early on, but he eventually rebounded, and now he's a top guy there, and he's going to be fighting for the world title next month of full gear. Um, do you think he would end up in a Jay White-esque position, or is he one of those guys where he just gets lost in the shuffle? I mean, it really just depends on what they do with MJF. I feel if they lose MJF, he obviously 
be the perfect person to put there. I don't know. I feel like it's tough. I feel like I can see him at a top level, but like you said, also, I mean, Omega's getting older. So is Moxley Danielson. So, like, I mean, it wouldn't be bad to keep him around when those guys start to peter off of me, Jericho. Um, but, I mean, I think he could be a top guy. It just really depends on how they see him. I mean, he has, like, had matches. It just, obviously, he's not contractually obligated. So, I don't know if they're going to, like, overly push him to the moon. But, I mean, I think it's possible, depending on when those other older, like, guys start moving away from the ring. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the MGF element is interesting. We'll see where he goes in 2024. I think he stays put, but again, we'll save that for the big prediction show at the end of the year. You mentioned the Perth show as well from uh, early in, and you talk about February 2024. That is in February 2024. That's right before WrestleMania. It's Elimination Chamber. Not the only international PLE happening in 2024. We found out earlier this week, WWE going to Berlin for the first time for a PLE next August, August 31st specifically. Um, it's going to be a PLE, I think called Bash in Berlin. Bash in Berlin. Okay, yeah, Bash in Berlin. I, I thought it was called, when I first saw the graphic, I thought it was called Bash of the Beach. But Bash in Berlin makes more sense. Although it would be cool if they brought back Bash of the Beach. I wouldn't complain because I think they own the trademark anyway. Um, no, they're going to Berlin for that show and also rumored from Fightful Select that same day, I think it was yesterday, that they might be going to Paris for a PLE in, in 2024 as well. Possibly Backlash. So in one fell swoop, we had a lot of international PLEs this year, last year. In one fell swoop in 2024 alone, they might be going to Australia, Berlin, which is both are set in stone, and maybe Paris as well. I mean, that's just wild. Uh, your thoughts on that when you hear that news? Um, I like it. I mean, I think it's one of those things. Like, I like it, but I don't. But I get like the point. It's like you want to go to other markets, but it's like when we get everything, it makes it less special. So... Like if we get less of it, it, in theory, will garner more bit like garner more interest once they do come back. So like me being a like I just want to go all the show. So yeah, me I'm gonna be like, oh, it sucks. But like in a business sense, it's like when they finally have like a big PLE in Massachusetts or in the area, it'll be like more likely to go since they weren't here every other month. So yeah, people said, oh, maybe they get UK SummerSlam. I mean. We had Clash of the Castle in Cardiff last year. I don't think we're getting a London WrestleMania anytime soon. John Cena needs to stop saying that. I mean, according to Pat McAfee, we're getting a fucking Indianapolis WrestleMania soon, too. So every city is going to get WrestleMania, apparently. It's going to be WrestleMania 2 all over again, where they go to three cities in the same night. But in all seriousness, as far as the uh, international shows, I think it's a big positive. I, I love the atmosphere at these shows. If they work... You know, why why move away from that formula? You can't do every show there, but I think the other takeaway is what you said. It makes that U.S. audience want to go to these shows more when they come back to the States. They're here all the time for Raws and Smackdowns, not so much pay-per-views anymore. Um, I was going to say, when was the last time they had a PLE at the Garden? Uh, not not the not the New York Garden, the, the Boston Garden. I mean, I just forgot they were at Survivor Series. They, they were there for Survivor Series a year ago. Um, but I like the fact they're branching out and we're going to get some fun crowds out of it. I mean, I hear Berlin, a, a Berlin pay-per-view. That sounds like it has a, a Gunther main event written all over it. No, yeah. I mean, I think it makes sense, like you said, just business-wise. But depending on who's on top and where you're going, I mean, that definitely helps through, like, the home crowd. Um, but, yeah, like you said, it could be, like, maybe Gunther's champion at the point or fighting for the championship. I don't know. I mean, it could be both. But, uh, I, I mean, like you said, I think business-wise it makes a ton of sense. No, I think it makes a ton of sense. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do in the new year and – uh Looking forward to watching all these shows. So, talking about Raw on Monday, not the most newsworthy episode. There really isn't a lot to talk about from this show. But I want to get some just quick thoughts from you as far as what you thought about the show on Monday, what you remember about it, and uh, just any top takeaways that you had, if any. Well, I thought it was a decent show. Like, a decent show. Um, wasn't the best. Wasn't the worst. I mean, it just, I feel like it was just like a kind of, a Raw that was just kind of there. Like, not a lot of, like, big things happened. I mean, we got, like, Priest and Cody announced for uh, Crown Jewel. Like, okay. Um, we have the Nikki Cross. She's just in a trance kind of thing. Like I said, I, we met her at uh, Elimination Chamber. Very nice. I, at this point, for me specifically, I just I don't really care about her character. I mean, she's been doing the same thing for so long. It's, like, what's... The, I guess my point was, like, what's the end game? Like, what's going to actually... Like, what's the payoff to this? I, I don't think it's going to be anything of note. Um, so that was kind of there, the Nia Jax, all that stuff. Don't, 
overly love to do in like the fatal five way. It's like I feel like they're they don't really have a ton of contenders to begin with, and you're just gonna bang off five of them. I don't think they're gonna beat Ripley, so um, interested to see that. Um, what else? I mean, Indy lost to Becky. I mean, I kind of saw that happening, but yeah, like in a nutshell, I just felt like it was a raw that was just kind of there. I mean, it was decent for what it was. I did think they would. They did announce with Cody and Damian was interesting. And were you surprised that they didn't put the briefcase on the line? I'm happy they were not doing the briefcase on the line, but I'm just surprised they didn't announce that. Um, no. I, I mean, I guess, like, if they put it on the line, it'd be more of a, like, is Cody going to win? I mean, I don't think he needs the briefcase. I'd keep it on Priest. I mm-hmm. guess, that, like you said, add interest, but I don't know. I'm fine with it not putting it on the line. I mean, I think it's dumb when they do put it on the line. We've seen that before because it's like if you didn't win the briefcase in the ladder match, then why do it now, you know? I think it's just to garner more interest unless they actually won. I mean, I just don't understand what, what, what the point of doing the match is. I guess it gets Cody on the show. That's obviously – I mean, that's the point. They want to get him in front of that Saudi Arabian crowd. Um, they're not bringing in Brock for it. It's the first Saudi Arabian show they've done that will not have Brock Lesnar on it. I guess that's kind of the question, too. We mentioned it last week a little bit when they lost the tag team titles. What are they doing with Cody and Jay in the meantime? Will we just see more of them against Judgment Day for the next couple of months until we get to the Rumble? I mean, are we get? I don't think we're... Honestly, at this point, we've talked so much about it, and I was convinced we were. I don't think we're getting war games at Survivor Series because if they sold more tickets, it's going to be a sellout of 16,000 people. How can they even fit two rings in there? Because they would have to change the whole ticket setup and the seat setup and whatnot. Yeah, it's true. I just don't think it's, I don't know. I just don't, I don't think they can add a second ring. Um, I don't know. I guess we'll see. But the best part of the show I thought on Monday was the Drew McIntyre, Sami Zayn match. I thought they went in there and had a really, really good match. Um, the Drew stuff is coming along really well. I think it'd be cool if Drew beat Rollins for the championship, but I, I just don't think it happens. We'll talk about Crown Jewel next week, but um, I think the next step of that McIntyre heel turn is him losing at Crown Jewel, and then maybe he turns heel either that night or right after. Or maybe like the next Raw or whatever. Or maybe soon after. I don't know. Yeah, we. I mean, we've just, I mean, I, I really want Rollins to lose the belt at this point, but I just don't think it's going to happen. I mean, when do you think, when is the ideal time? I mean, obviously as soon as possible according to what you're saying, but do you think he loses it probably closer to Mania or at Mania itself? I just don't think if he hasn't lost it by now, he's probably not losing it anytime soon. That includes via a cash in either. Yeah, I think if he's going to lose, it'll be WrestleMania time. Yeah, I think it's going to be a while. Um, so he transitioned. There's not really much to talk about with Raw, but I do want to get your thoughts on this. NXT Halloween Havoc Night 1 on Tuesday was a really good show, actually. Had a lot of positive buzz, big positive reception. Not one, but two new champions crowned. Chase U becoming the new NXT North uh, North American, NXT Tag Team Champions. And we have Lyra Valkyria, the new NXT Women's Champion. Both outcomes surprising me. I did not think Chase U were becoming Tag Team Champions. And I certainly... Not certainly. I mean, I think she had a better chance. Because I even said a couple weeks ago, Lyra is kind of the perfect person to ultimately dethrone Becky. And Becky's had a lot of defenses so far um, as the NXT Women's Champion. She was only champion for like a month. But in that time frame, she beat Tiffany for the title. She retained the title against Tiffany at uh, No Mercy last month. She beat Natalia to retain the title on Raw. She beat Tegan Knox to retain the title. Indy Hartwell. That's at least four or five different defenses in the span of a month. And it also looked like she would retain here because she has something going on clearly on Raw with Zia Lee. But they did have her drop the championship on Tuesday to Lyra in clean fashion in what was a great main event. They didn't get a lot of time, and it started so close to the top of the show that I was kind of worried, okay, they're just going to be short on time. But no, they went overtime, and uh, they had a really, really good match, and Lyra won, and it was an awesome moment for her. So, again, we'll talk about the overall show in a second, but I guess just your... Um, you know, your your takeaway and your reaction to Lyra Valkyria, the new NXT Women's Champion. Because I know, obviously, you predicted it last week. You were correct, and you're a big Lyra Valkyria fan. Yeah, I wasn't surprised by the, the finish, honestly. I mean, I predicted it last week. Came true. Just kidding. I fell out of my bed in shock. <laughs> but, uh, no, I thought this was a really good match. Like you said, I was a little nervous as well. I remember I, was, I came home late, and I was catching up, and I pretty much got to the main event. Right around, like, 9.55, I'm like, what's this match going to be, like, five minutes? But they did run over a little bit, and I thought the match itself was really well done. Um, when she kicked out of the manhandle slam the first time, I was like, okay, there's a chance. I don't know. I just feel like we kick out of her finish, I'm like, okay, there's definitely a chance. But then I had, like, the theory that I remember that when she faced Tiffany, I think Tiffany kicked out it as well, and then she hit her with it again, like, pretty closely after and beat her. So I was like, all right, we'll see what happens. And then she went for it again. I was like, son of a bitch. And then she reversed into, like, that cradle roll-up. 
and just rolled her up one, two, three. I was like, holy shit. Um, but I'm in the crowd at Big Pop. I'm in, obviously, it's for the for the new title, like the title change, Big Pop. But I don't know. I feel like they were kind of were buying Lyra after she won. I would kind of expect, like, more booze and people kind of pissed. But mm-hmm. it seemed like people were behind her, which is nice. Um, but, no, nah, I was stunned. But, I mean, like you said, Becky did have a good amount of defenses. Like you said, the whole Zia Lee thing, I mean, that kind of put a thought in my head. Like, maybe she won't win because of the whole Zia Lee thing. But, uh, I mean, Lyra beat her right here. So, we'll, I mean, maybe we'll get a rematch somewhere down the line. But, I mean, Lyra won, and I, I was pretty happy, so... Yeah, listen, I think Lyra is someone they've been trying to get over for a while now. Um, they tried with her a while ago, and it just wasn't really working. She's gotten a lot of title shots this year, including a battleground when we were there. People thought that she may walk out of that tournament, the new champion. She did not, and which was the right call. Tiffany was more ready at that point than she was. Lyra has always been better in the ring, but Tiffany was more ready as the complete package. And Lyra just wasn't really over. They've done a good job of getting her more over with the audience in recent months with the video packages, working with Becky, now beating Becky Lynch. She might be the first, I think she's the first person to beat Becky clean. Not the first person to beat Becky, period, but the first person to beat Becky clean since I think probably Bianca at SummerSlam 2022 for the Raw Women's Championship, uh, which is a pretty big endorsement. So I thought that was really cool. I was not completely expecting it just because I didn't know if they would do it on a rant. I mean, it wasn't a random NXT. It was Halloween Havoc, but... You know, again, they're teasing the Zia Lee thing. I thought they might stretch it out for longer. She was only champion for a month. Do you think? I think they made the most, not even really a question, more of a statement, but I think they made the most of Becky as champion and really elevated the division in the process and really only in the span of 30 days, which is kind of impressive. No, yeah, I think she, like, had great matches with some of the younger women, so I kind of, like, spotlight what they have. Um, like I said, she kind of helped put Tiffany on the map even more than she was. I mean, she was really good. Uh, before the match with with Becky, but I think that kind of like spotlight, like yeah, she is actually really good. Um, she's not just facing NXT like people that are green or developing. Like she had two really really good matches with Becky Lynch, who's one of the best in the business right now. So I think it definitely helped her a ton. I mean, seemingly from what we saw on Tuesday, I think it helped Lyra a lot as well. Um, but yeah, like helped Tegan get a little bit more over Indy Harwell. Um, I mean. That's kind of what her position is now. I mean, it's not like she's like Charlotte going for the title every other week. So Hmm. I think people were kind of mad that she won it, but I feel like she did more for the NXT Women's Division than Charlotte did when she won the belt. So, um, no, I think it's good. I'm glad she's not like holding on the belt, just beating everyone. Um, Now we'll see what's next for Becky. Yeah, do you think we still get that Becky Zia Lee feud just without the championship? Which is an interesting direction to take because it's not... I mean, we saw a non-title feud with her and Trish Stratus, but that's sold itself because they're two big names. Zia Lee is someone that has not been in the show in forever. She's having a match next Monday with Candice LeRae. She's not over at all, but I think working with Becky might help her. It's not going to get her over automatically, but I think it's a good use of Becky before they get to Becky and uh, Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... I think that's definitely... I think you would still keep kind of go in that direction, especially, like you said, if we're thinking she's going, she's not really doing much until she goes to face Rhea at Mania. But I think, I mean, I'm not looking for her to lose again, but I mean, honestly, I feel like, I don't know how much Zia Lee would really get out of it, but I feel like, like the Becky character itself has kind of felt like, I don't know, not stale, but just isn't like what she used to be. So maybe yeah. taking a couple more losses could kind of, I don't know, change her character a little bit, kind of get like a fire under her ass and kind of, get her back to where she was before. So, like, I wouldn't honestly hate that if, like, maybe she loses again and kind of, like, reinvents herself a little bit. Because I like the character, but it's kind of been the same thing. She's not, like, she's the man. She's big time. Like, she, like they say both of them. She's kind of, like, a mixture of both. Not really. But, yeah. I don't know. I feel like maybe another loss can kind of help rebuild her. Like, she is over and stuff, but, like, she's not where she should be. I feel like with over being how over she should be. So, maybe another loss or something down the line can kind of get her light a, like a new fire on her ass and kind of get her back to where she was before. I agree, and I think working with fresh faces will only help with that. I think having the same matches with, like, you know, Bianca and all these other women she's faced before, like uh, Charlotte and people like that won't help. But, you know, if they do some new stuff and uh, they have her continue working with the fresher faces, I think it's a good step in the right direction before she inevitably faces Rhea Ripley for that Raw, or rather, uh, Women's World Championship, which you know is coming at WrestleMania. Um, any other thoughts on the rest of uh, Halloween Havoc Night 1? I thought it was a really good show overall. Overall, I thought it was a solid show. I mean, a ton of women matches on there. I thought they all were pretty decent. The Dolan and Davenport match, like, I don't know, I'm not huge into both of them. So, like, for me, it kind of felt flat. It just was what it was. Um, but, like, the Chasey win, like you said, was pretty big. 
uh, Thea and JC will face uh, Piper and Chelsea next week. I like that. They kind of started, they did a really good job of like promoting next week as well, which I feel like NXT's done a better job than Ross Matt have done, honestly. But uh like that. I like the, the Kalani Jordan advance to the finals. I think her and Volo Vice, I mean, both very green, but I think they both respectfully have their own kind of futures. I feel like they both could be big um, once they kind of get the season. I think they both have great looks. Just need to work on the ring stuff. But no, I like that. Um, Roxanne winning was, I think we both had her winning. I just, I don't know. I feel like her and Braun at this point just spinning wheels. I mean, glad she's winning, but I mean. It's time for what's next, yeah. Maybe we'll get a call up after the new year, but I mean, for her, I mean, there's nothing left for her to do. I don't. I really don't know what else to do with her. I mean, I, I see him with Braun, honestly, but glad you won here. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. Um, oh, yeah, Alexis that... King, he had his debut. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. I kind of, I don't know, like, it was fine for what it was. I kind of wish he won more dominant. Like, he actually had, like, a decent, like, back and forth with Dante Chen, I yeah. think his name was. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I mean, it was fine for what it was, but for his debut, I kind of expected, like, more maybe a more dominant performance. Like, it was kind of back and forth. I'm like, is he, like, going to lose? <laughs> like, it was one of those, I'm like, who are we pushing there, pal? Like, I felt yeah, like, I agree. I felt like it was a decent match, but I also felt like he gave up way too much offense to someone that, like, I mean, they called him, they kept saying the gatekeeper of NXT. I don't, I don't think I've ever even seen him on TV, this Dante Chen guy, so... <laughs> I thought for what it was, it was fine, but I want, I kind of would want a more of a dominant performance for King to kind of get over with the fans. Like, you're having a back and forth with someone I've never seen. I mean, maybe he's, like, doing the coconut loop every week, but I, I think a more dominant performance was needed there. No, I agree with that. I think they could have had him beat him in two minutes instead of four minutes, but, uh, you know, I thought it was a fine debut. I really like the entrance, though. I think he looks good. Yeah, I know. I like the entrance. I like the throne thing. That's cool. Don't, just don't hit it with a hammer like Cody. <laughs> exactly. Night two. Um, I, I I know we predicted this match last week, so maybe they bumped it from night one to night two, but Mr. Stone against Braun Breaker, that's happening next week. I know we said Breaker for that. Uh, quick predictions for the rest of the show. Kalani Jordan, Lola Vice, NXT Women's Breakout Tournament Finals. Um, I think Kalani Jordan goes over. I know they're high on both women, specifically Lola Vice. She's got that MMA background. Um, were you, I, I think I've already asked you this. Were you familiar with her prior to WWE or no? I mean, a, a little bit. She had a little buzz right before she went to WWE. Yeah, uh, I remember like her signing MMA getting world. some buzz, yeah. Um, so she's been heavily touted since coming in. Who do you think goes over in the finals of the tournament? I mean, looking at the champion right now, I'd say Vice, because I think she gets a title shot. I oh, mean, right, I think yeah. going to do Jordan versus Valkyria right now. Like I said, I mean, it doesn't, uh, they never really put a date on it, so I guess you don't know what's going to happen. But, I don't know, I like Jordan a lot, but I think, I mean, Val, uh, not Valkyria, Vice has been around longer. I feel like, like you said, I feel like they they like her a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to go with, with Vice. Okay, now, I think I think Jordan's going to go over, but you can't really. I think both women have bright features, so you can't really go wrong with either one. Um, spin the wheel, make the deal match. Tables, ladders, and scares is basically a TLC match. The Creed brothers and uh, the former Los Lotharios, Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo. Um, now that we got new tag team champions, I mean they were already baby faces. The champions were. The Creed brothers have lost a lot. They really should be on their way out. I, I think they're winning here, though. I think Angel and Humberto are just an enhancement team. For the rest of the division, but I think I I would like to see them win, but I think the Creed brothers go over. This is a tough one. Um, I like the Creeds. I feel like they're kind of in the Braun, Roxanne, Perez kind of realm for me. It's like they've done everything. Like I don't think they're gonna have like another big title run. I'll go with with uh, Los Lotharios. I just I mean, I just feel like. With the Creeds, like I said, I feel like I put them in the same kind of stratosphere as Roxanne and Braun. Like, I don't think they're winning the belt again. They've kind of done everything. I, I would just I would just have the Lotharios win if that's kind of like the direction they want to go in. Yeah, and the Creed brothers are overdue for a call-up, and hopefully it happens soon. Uh, Tiffany Stratton, Fallon Henley. I assume an easy win for Tiffany Stratton here. Stratton wins LOL. Yeah. Um, tag team titles, women's tag team titles, actually, defended for the first time in, in months since Chelsea Green and Piper Nevin became champions, or even Chelsea and Sonya. We have not seen a single title defense until now, I think. Um, they're going to be taking on Chase Hughes, Thea Hale, and J.C. Jane. I think Green and Niven and Niven retain. I'll see. Uh, I'm curious to see where this Thea Hale, J.C. Jane thing goes, but I think the champions retain here. 
One second, I almost sneezed. Um, <laughs> as with a blow snot. Um, yeah, I think I would keep the belts on Piper and Chelsea. Like I said, I feel like we don't really know the attentions yet of Jane and and, and Thea Hale. Like she tried to help them cheat win, and they didn't take it. And they still won. Um, so like she can be like the bad apple. We really don't know yet. Um, but I, I would keep the belts on Piper and and Jason Jane a little bit longer. NXT North American Championship, Dirty Dominic Mysterio, excuse me, Dirty Dominic Mysterio, Nathan Frazier. Um, I think it's too soon for Dominic to be losing the belt right back to someone else. He just got it back from Trick Williams. I like Nathan Frazier a lot. I don't think he becomes champion here, but I think it should be a fun match. Um, I got Mysterio winning. What about you? I got Mysterio winning as well. Okay, we'll get to the main event here. Carmelo Hayes challenging uh, Ilya Dragunov in a rubber match for the NXT Women... Why am I saying the wrong titles today? It's the NXT Championship. I'm looking at the women's match here from from night one. It's the NXT Men's Championship, all right? It's going to be the third encounter between these two. Um, who do you got going over here? I mean, I think you got to keep the belt on Ilya. He just won the belt. I like Carmelo. I just... I already keep the belt on Ilya. Yeah, I think Ilya goes over, but how does he go over? Does he win clean, or do we see some interference from Trick Williams coming back, who was attacked a week or two ago? Does Wes Lee come back? Was he the one that attacked Trick Williams? What do you think's going on there with those guys? I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's like they're trying to get you to think it's it's uh, Pays. I don't think it is him, but, I mean, they got that idea kind of in your head right now, but I, I think it's... Tough. I, I think I think it's I think it's probably Hayes, but I feel like they're teasing it so much that it's him. I don't think it's him. If that makes sense. Honestly, I I, mean, I don't think it's him at this point. I thought it was initially, but I think it's going to end up being someone else, like a Wesley, who's coming back soon or whatever. Um, do you think they could have it be Carmelo and do that dumb Triple H Shawn Michaels angle from O2 where it was so obvious that it was Triple H that it ended up being Triple H. I mean, they can't go that same direction, right? I know Shawn Michaels is booking the show now, but I hope he's not rehabbing, he's not reusing that angle, which was dumb in the first place. I know you love it, but it was a very dumb angle 20 years ago. Dude, that shit was great, pal. <laughs> so obvious that it was Triple H. Literally running around the locker room asking everyone who it was. It was him the entire time. He attacked Shawn Michaels the week before. Everyone saw it coming. Like, no shit, it was you. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I hope they don't do that. The camera zooms in. Oh my God, it's Triple H. Like, no shit. He, he turned on Shawn Michaels a month before that. I still don't understand that storyline a month later. I'm like, did I miss something? You missed it. I guess so. Uh, <laughs> it was you, Hunter. You're damn right it was me. Like, no shit, it was you. <laughs> hey, listen, it made for a great video package. I can't complain too much, right? Oh, God, get me started now. I enjoyed Dynamite last night. Actually, probably one of the more newsworthy episodes in some time. Uh, we had MJF holding on to the Dynamite Diamond Ring again, beating Juice Robinson. Um, Okada wrestling in the main event randomly with Orange Cassidy against Brian Danielson and Claudio Castagnoli. RVD in action alongside Hook beating the Dark Order. Who gives a shit about the Dark Order, but I, I like RVD. Whatever. Uh, Ruby Soho unsuccessful again and challenging for a women's championship. The sky is blue. What else is new there? Um, we had a sky ring of on. Blue or the sky is blue? <laughs> the sky is blue, but sky is blue. Okay, okay, I just wanted confirmation. Yeah, there. I get confused. If we were talking about AEW, I should probably specify. Uh, we had a Ring of Honor six-man tag team title defense. Again, who gives a shit, but I like the match. And Sting's big gift from Tony Khan was none other than the Nature Boy Rick fucking Flair. Which I kind of had a feeling it might be because Darby Allen in talking about the gift on Rampage or Collision last week was like, whoa, it's going to be big. Like, he didn't say woo where it was overt, it, it was like obvious that it would be Ric Flair, but I'm thinking, eh, I feel like that might be a subtle woo, and it obviously was. Um, any thoughts on Dynamite from Wednesday, and just any top takeaways that you got? Yeah, I think it was, like you said, I think it was a pretty decent show. I fucking almost fell out of my bed laughing when I saw Ric Flair. <laughs> I know he didn't save his money, but Jesus Christ. I just Seriously. I, to me, I just found it comical. Um, yeah, I thought it was a decent show overall. Like I said, MGF went in the Diamond Ring again. I mean... I guess. I mean, I feel like eventually he's going to lose, right? I mean, fifth time. I, I thought kind of had a feeling he might lose here, but he won again. Um, yeah, I thought, like I said, I thought it was a decent show. I just honestly I just died laughing at Ric Flair. That's like the first takeaway I can think of. Yeah, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not surprised they brought him in, but I think my bigger takeaway is the fact that if Ric Flair is here and he said during his promo, oh, I want to be with you till the end of the ride or till the end of the road or whatever it is, do you think that might imply that he might be with Sting until he's done 
in the ring in four months? Do you think Ric Flair might be his manager until March? That would be terrible. I hope not. God, he already I mean, has it sounds Darby. like there's a chance. Like you said, the way it's worded, it's like, yeah. I'm going to be here with you until the end of the road. You're like, for the love of God, no. I mean, I'm hopeful that it wasn't, that isn't the case, because I, I did not watch the show live, but I went on Twitter later. I did not see a Ric Flair's All Elite graphics that did make me somewhat optimistic. Hey, be optimistic, pal. Oh, my God, that would just be awful. I mean, listen, they announced in that same segment at Full Gear, it's going to be Christian Cage, Luchasaurus, and Nick Wayne against Darby Allen, Sting, and a partner. I know they tried to recruit Adam Copeland, and he's still on the fence. And they're obviously just dragging it out. And I, I like the fact they're doing this match and not rushing into Copeland and Christian at full gear. I think that'd be dumb. They should hold off on that if that's their big feud. I'm glad they're not getting right into that. They they joked about Ric Flair. If Ric Flair's in a fucking match, I swear to God. I mean, he's not. He can't be, right? He can't be. There's no way. Anything's possible, pal. When you have a 1990s WW, WCW mark in charge, anything's possible, pal. <laughs> Ric Flair's final match, but not really from last year. Oh, stop. Come Sounds on. Terrible. You want to see Ric Flair and his tidy whiteies of full gear? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I really say, don't. I can't say that was a straight face. I just can't. I, I, if, if Christian were to hit him with an unprettier and, and he would crumble into dust, then maybe. <laughs> but, you know, other than that, I, I can't see how that would be a good idea. Their match 10 plus years ago, Sting and Ric Flair, I still remember to this day. I think it was Flair's final TNA match, if I'm not mistaken. It might have been his final match, period, um, until he wrestled his last match, quote-unquote, last year. Him and him and Flair had a match in TNA in 2011. That was fucking... I mean, it wasn't terrible, actually. It was just not great. But he looked terrible then, and that was 2011. We do not need to see that 12, 13 years later. Um, but yeah, I like the show overall. They're building up the card for full gear a bit better than they have for past pay-per-views. They typically wait until the last minute to confirm shit. So I'm glad that's not the case for uh, Full Gear, and it's shaping up to be a fun show. And we got Survivor Series coming up, Crown Jewel, next weekend. That's going to be coming up next Saturday. Before then, we will have predictions next Thursday here on the show. New episodes every single week, Mr. Marceau. WrestleRant.com, WrestleRantRadio.com, iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Pandora, and Amazon Music. Rate the show, review the show, subscribe to the show. Never miss a new episode every single week. Uh, enjoy Halloween, Mr. Marcel. Be sure to send me some pictures of your costumes when you guys go out next week. Sounds good, pal. Enjoy the weekend, pal. Talk to you soon. Later. Join Graham, GSM Matthews, and RJ Marceau every Thursday as they run down their weekly wrestling rants, offer expert analysis, host exclusive interviews, and more. Subscribe today on all your favorite podcast platforms and never miss an episode of Wrestle Rant Radio. Wrestle Rant Radio.